All right. The last speaker in this session is uh, James Bennett. He's going to be talking about the good parts of Django. Hi. OK, so I know you're all anxious to get to lunch. Fortunately, there aren't that many good things in Django, so this won't take very long. Um, just by way of quick introduction, my name is James Bennett. I'm uh, one of the release managers for Django. Used to work at the Lawrence Journal World, uh, which is the company Django originally came out of. I've been involved with Django for quite some time. Not as long as Django has existed, though. Uh, the initial public preview of it, which I remember downloading and playing with and falling in love with, uh, was in July 2005. So we're looking at, you know, about nine years of Django releases, growing, adding code, adding features. What does Django look like today? Well, we just did the 1.7 beta. 161,923 lines of Python uh, was the count that I got out of that. Django is now, you know, we, we call it a full stack framework because we have, well, a full stack of all of these things, request and response and templating and ORM and forms and authentication, and it just keeps going and going and going. We have this huge list of features. Um, Django can now be literally described as the 800-pound gorilla of the Python web framework world, a, a title that I believe we claim from Zope by throwing enough bananas at them to blow up the building they were on. So. This raises a question. Aren't other frameworks smaller or lighter or better or more flexible than Django? What is it that Django still has, still does, that makes it a good choice? So I want to talk about three things, mainly. The good parts of Django. First one I want to talk about is going to be the HTTP abstractions that Django provides and the way Django handles HTTP and your request response cycle. Second is the conservative, and yes, I do mean that word, conservative approach to adding features. Third and finally, our secret weapon. You know, amongst our weapons are surprise, fear, a fanatical devotion to the Pope, and the Django application, which is something we will talk about in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about HTTP. HTTP sucks. What, no love for that? Okay. HTTP has some problems. Has nine different request methods. God only knows how you keep track of all of them and what options go with them. It is completely and hilariously unaware that Unicode exists. Um, persistence and auth and streaming and security and all these other things that we care about here in 2014 were kind of either never added or tacked on. It was like, oh, maybe we should do that 10 years later. So HTTP really kind of sucks as a protocol to work with. And traditionally, if you wanted to write programs that spoke HTTP, you wrote CGI. CGI is also not a lot of fun. Um, here's in theory. In theory, if you were to read a CGI tutorial, this is what it would tell you would tell you that you're going to write a script. The web server is going to set up all of the request information in environment variables and then invoke your script. Your script is also going to receive any submitted data from the request over its standard input. Your script will then read the environment to figure out what's going on, read the standard input to figure out what's going on, do its processing, and then on standard output, send out your response headers and your response body. Who here believes that this is how CGI actually works in the real world? I notice not a lot of hands. That's a good thing. Here's how CGI actually works. First of all, you hope and pray that the web server will actually invoke your script. It may or may not. At some point, you're going to type a command that looks like this. You're not going to understand why. And if you don't get why you're doing that, ask someone who has a very, very large beard to explain what that means. <laughs> the environment that you're going to be handed by your web server is full of lies and sadness and things that are going to make you upset. 
at some point you're finally just going to give up on trying to figure out what URL was requested because that information could be in any of multiple different environment variables. And you're just going to try to fork bomb the server, after which you will finally completely give up and start drinking. This is how real programmers really do CGI. I have done this for a living. Now, fortunately in Python, we don't have to write CGI. We write WSGI. Unfortunately, WSGI is basically CGI done in Python. I realize, you know, some people may not like hearing WSGI criticized. Having a standard is important. WSGI is our standard gateway interface. But, number one, it is a CGI style programming model. You are handed an environment, you are expected to parse and understand what is in that environment rather than be hand handed any kind of normalized data. Which means that your entire WSGI stack has to parse that environment. Okay, now we pass it to this component which has to reparse it, which passes it to that component which has to reparse it. And you just end up with this mess of parsing an environment that really was never that good of a programming model to begin with. Second, WSGI doesn't really have any way for different components to communicate with each other in a standardized way. You have to go and either invent your own things that you stick in the environment and hope something else doesn't trample on them, or you have to go invent an out-of-band signaling process. The way you return HTTP responses from WSGI sucks. As far as I know, even people who really love WSGI agree with me on this one. And finally, it inherits HTTP's willful blindness to the fact that character sets other than Latin 1 might exist somewhere. Um, this is a real problem that you will run into. Uh, the spec on WSGI actually, I don't remember exactly what it does on Python 3. On Python 2, you are required to return a byte string containing only um, ISO 8859-1 code points for a lot of things. And the WSGI ref module actually checks that you passed exactly the type stir and not any subclass or functionality you added to it. So, can we do better than this? Yes, we can. We can do much better than this. So let's do better. Let's start with HTTP requests. Let's have a class called HTTP request. Let's have it already parse and normalize everything for you. Let's have it have all the things you wanted to access, you know, available as attributes or with dictionaries for things like the query string or the post data. Let's actually handle the character encoding in a sane and consistent way so that the programmer doesn't have to worry about that when they're writing their application code. Now that we've got a request, let's do a response. Let's make HTTP responses really easy to construct and play with. Let's not fool around with any of this, you know, start response and send your headers and then do this and then do this. Let's just have an HTTP response. Let's have subclasses of the HTTP response for, you know, common things like not being able to find something or needing to issue a redirect. Then finally, let's tie it all together. Let's say, okay, just write a callable that takes one of these requests and returns a response or raises an exception. Let's do URL parsing the simplest possible way. Let's just write some regular expressions and say, this regular expression goes to this callable. And, you know, if you ever need extra arguments in there, okay, we'll just put some capturing groups in the regular expression. And you know what? That's it. That's HTTP in Django. That's all you have to do. You have these same normalized APIs and abstractions. You have this easy way, because hopefully everybody already knows regular expressions, right? You're all regular expression masters. I know you are. Everybody knows regular expressions, easy enough to wire up the URLs, and Billy May's voice. Is Jesse Noller in here? Oh. But wait, there's more. We also get HTTP and request response lifecycle. We get a middleware system. Now granted, all middleware systems suck, including Django's, including WSGI middleware, including every middleware system ever invented. They all suck, but you have to have one. We have one. We have signals. We have a way for components within Django to signal each other and listen to those signals completely naturally, completely baked into the framework. We have the ability, because everything is just a callable, to do decorators for composition. You can stick basically anything you can think of pre or post processing on any one of these callables just as a decorator. 
because it is just callables all the way down, or turtles all the way down, as I believe Simon Willison likes to put it, sitting there in the front row. Finally, we do, in fact, do WSGI. Yes, we read PEP333 so you didn't have to. Because once you've used all of these useful abstractions, you have a Django project, which is a WSGI application. And Django, under the hood, will do the hard work of translating WSGI to actually sane HTTP abstractions for you. Personally, borrowing a phrase from Jamie Zawinski where he once said, first off, Java doesn't have free. After that, everything is gravy. I'm willing to take quite a hit in terms of importing libraries to get sane HTTP abstractions. Maybe this is because I've been doing it long enough that I just want to bang my head against the keyboard sometimes, but to me, that's worth a lot. <clears throat> Django has, for my money, and I've looked at a lot of the frameworks, absolutely the best HTTP abstraction and request response lifecycle handling of any of the current generation of Python web frameworks. It is absolutely one of the best things about Django, and I would probably still use it even if I weren't using any of the other components. Second thing I want to talk about is conservatism. Django is a conservative framework. And I really do mean this. I really, you know, I'm not going to call Django minimal. I don't think anybody would ever do that. Django is not a minimal framework. Django is a conservative framework. So take an example. We have this filter that uh, was new in 1.4 that uh, all it does is take a string and truncate it at a certain number of characters. Um, if you're familiar with Django's development process, you know that getting that in took four years. I'm not even joking. Coming soon in Django 1.7, in fact, Andrew Godwin was just here talking about it, we're going to have a migration API built into the core framework. That only took about six years. Django is incredibly conservative about adding new things. Things get into Django very, very slowly. In fact, now some things are getting out. Uh, if you look at the last few releases and if you look at roadmaps and plans, we are either have removed or are in the process of removing quite a lot of things, especially in contrib. Probably more of them are going to go. We used to have the uh, comments framework, which is still in Django, but I don't think is anywhere officially documented. Uh, we used to have the data browse application, which now is just gone. The local flavor application, which has now been split out into its own completely separate package. Uh, the markup application, which no longer exists. Probably a lot more things are going to come out of Django in the near future. What this means is that Django has reached a point where things are difficult to add and easy to remove. And not just whole libraries or APIs, if you look at the deprecation warnings that Django issues uh, from one release to the next, the things that are deprecated, we go uh, one release, two release, then it's gone. We are not shy about that. We, we do have a compatibility policy, we do deprecate things slowly, but we get them out. Now usually this is described as a bad thing. A lot of people over the years have talked about how frustrated they are when they're trying to contribute to Django and they have an idea for a great new feature and it just sort of seems like it stalls. It seems like it takes forever to get this in there. Uh, poor Eric Florenzano with the truncate filter literally did spend four years championing that um, on every mailing list he could find in every venue he could find. And finally, it did make it in. But generally, people you know, treat this as a bad thing. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for Django to be as conservative as it is. In fact, I think it can be a good thing. Um, conservatism as an approach to framework design there's a strong preference for letting solutions bubble up out of the community. And in fact, Andrew's talk about migrations is a great example of that. We have had, over Django's history, several competing migration frameworks. South is the one that seems to have won and captured the hearts and minds of Django users. If we had just picked something way back at the beginning or rolled our own, we never would have gotten something as good as South. Uh, the core framework these days, um, I've heard Jacob talk about this and I think he's on to something. 
should be more about providing the underlying APIs to let you do things rather than providing fully baked features. I mean, obviously there's still some things that are gonna have to be real features that are in there, but mostly just providing the API support. And the result of this is you end up with, Django's often criticized as making it hard to swap components, you end up with things that are more swappable than you expected. Um, at my day job at Mozilla, I work on the Mozilla Developer Network, the number of things in Django that we don't use or that we use something else swapping in, we don't use the template system, we use Jinja. Uh, swapping that in is really easy and making Django use it. Uh, the result of this is often you get slightly more swappable. Um, you also get more stability over time. Something that makes me at least feel warm and fuzzy is every once in a while I'll see someone on Reddit or on a mailing list or Hacker News or talking about how they tried Django way back in the day and then they got busy doing something else and now they've come back to it and they say, well, I can see it's got all these new features but it still feels very much the same framework that I learned you know, four or five years ago. Django is conceptually very, very stable. Uh, features go into Django not when there's hype around them, not when there's lots of people saying we need to have this now. Features go in when they're ready most of the time, we hope. Um, competition often ends up giving us better solutions. South, again, is a wonderful example of that. We've also had other features where we've had competing proposals and we've had things even sometimes that never made it in because we never could get a solid competing proposal. Um, the very first year that we did Summer of Code, uh, officially I was mentoring Yanis, who now you know, needs no mentoring, uh, talking about packaging and making Django more friendly to packaging tools and setup tools, and he put in a ton of work, and it just never really played out. Nothing satisfactory ever came out of the community as far as making Django play nicer with setup tools and so we never turned into an all-in setup tools based framework. Sometimes that's the result of having this type of competition is you realize there's nothing that quite makes, quite makes the cut. So nothing goes into the framework just yet. So Django overall, feel free to disagree. I think Django's conservatism towards new features and conservatism towards adding things towards making major radical changes is really one of its strengths, primarily for that reason of that person who comes in on Hacker News or Reddit or on the mailing list, or that person who learned Django once upon a time and now they don't need to learn it all over again. Django is not a completely new framework every year. We get new features every year, we get new things that we can do every year, but Django itself remains remarkably stable and consistent conceptually. Speaking of conceptually, the third and final good part, and this is my personal favorite, um, I've given several talks on this, is encapsulation of applications, or maybe if you want to have a little pun, encapsulation. As Django's secret weapon, um, you look at other ways to do applications. A Django project, as we mentioned, is a WSGI application. Um, what is a Django application? though. If you want to talk about, say, pure WSGI applications or applications in a lot of other frameworks, uh, we're talking about monoliths or black boxes. A lot of cases where you sort of feel a need to do everything in one application or everything in one endpoint. And sort of because of the nature of WSGI, anybody who's more thoroughbred exposing WSGI to you all the way through it's going to end up being a lot more black box because it's harder for WSGI components to communicate with each other. Um, you don't have the sort of up and down the stack signaling communication processes that you would have from something else. So you end up designing either these really huge things or these things that sort of act like black boxes or both. Um, whereas a Django application could be any of these things, models, views, utility code, middleware, forms, but they are all the Django bits, or they are all the Django APIs. Now, I mentioned, for example, you don't have to use Django's template system, but if you use Django's APIs for loading and rendering a template, 
it just works, even if you're using Django's template system, if you're using Jinja, if you're using something else. Django gives you a bunch of safe APIs that you can rely upon being present, a lot of safe assumptions that you can make about things that are going to be present, things that you can use. And this makes integration of lots of different components a whole lot easier than integrating a monolith or integrating a bunch of black boxes. Django applications, as a result, are free to be sort of encapsulated, pluggable functionality. First time I ever talked about this was six years ago at um, a Django con in California. And at the time, I thought this was the selling point of Django. I still think it is. Uh, the ability to write a Django application as a single, reusable, pluggable, encapsulated bit of whatever you need it to do. At the time, my example was Django registration, Django profiles, some things that I'd put out there as examples. Um, since then, people have gone above and beyond in terms of that. Um, sort of the philosophy of Unix tools. A Django application is just like a Unix tool. Do one thing, do it well. So now, for example, I have a personal blog. My personal blog has an installed apps list with 12 entries in it. At my day job where I work on MDN, we have an installed apps list with closer to 50 apps in it. And about a dozen of those are ones that either we rolled ourselves or are specific to MDN. The rest of them are either other Mozilla tools or things that were completely third party that we pulled in and integrated. You can do this with Django. Django Packages is a website that lists, well, packages that you can get for Django. Currently lists 2,206 available apps. Um, as much as it's a cliche, it, you can say with Django, there's an app for that. Um, apps really are the secret weapon, in my opinion. The fact that you can take user registration or user profiles or signing up with persona or a wiki or a, take something else off MDN, a studio for showing demos of web technology. You can wrap any of these things up, these sort of one sentence ideas into an application that you can just pull off the internet, plug into your website, do a little bit of integration work. You don't have to worry about, oh, well, is this app using some completely different framework? Is this app using some completely different ORM, some completely different form library, completely different controller setup? The lovely thing about Django is it, as much as people complain about there being a full stack um, and feeling locked in, what you get in return for accepting some basic components, and you don't have to accept all of them, what you get in return for accepting some basic components is the ability to do this, to compose large, complex sites with lots of moving parts without having to write all of the code yourself, without having to do tons and tons and tons of integration work. So much of every production Django site I see nowadays is off-the-shelf components that are taking advantage of the fact that you can just go pull a bunch of Django apps off of PyPy, off of Django packages, off of wherever you want to index them from, and say, okay, we get that functionality from that, that functionality from that. Everything that is not the core of your site, your core business logic that you need to write, you can probably outsource to something else. And then you can just write one or two little apps that encapsulate what your site needs to do. I really think, I always have thought, this is Django's secret weapon. Um, the encapsulation, reusability, pluggability of Django applications, and the concept of the Django application as being something so radically different from what all the other Python frameworks were doing, which was mostly an application as a WSGI application. Um, that's about all I've got, and I hear people clapping in the room next door, which means I timed this just about right. Uh, so we have, uh, I believe, about 10, 15 minutes for questions. If anybody wants, I believe we have microphones. Just the one? Yeah. I have... <laughs> I have uh, two questions. Uh, first, why isn't there a Django booth in the uh, Expo Hall? Why? Isn't there a Django booth in the Expo Hall? Is there one? Uh, there is no Django booth. There's, a, there's other booths for other frameworks, but there's no Django booth at all. 
Is there, um, was there a reason behind that? Why isn't there one? I don't know. Um, that would be a question probably for the DSF or, or someone who knows more about that than I do. Okay. And then the other uh, question I have, um, ah, I think I forgot it. <laughs> uh, give me a second, I'll, I'll come back. Okay. Um, so you've mentioned uh, you use Django at your job and you use uh, Jinja for the template part of yep. Django. And I'm just wondering, like, what's your typical uh, Django? Like, what are you using Django for now and wh what parts are you replacing? Okay. Um, so at work, we, we are the Mozilla Developer Network, um, MDN. Mostly, we are a wiki of documentation on web technologies, which is written in Django mostly. Um, backend is Python using Django request response, Django ORM, uh, Jinja for templates with Jingo as the integration library, and a Node.js service providing scripting and templating. Like if you're familiar with uh, on Wikipedia where you can do like templates that do sort of scripty things, uh, we have a service written in JavaScript that does that. Um, we also have a demo studio where people can upload demonstrations of different web technologies. That is entirely Django. Thanks. Okay. And we also, we sort of use Django's authentication system. Uh, we replace it. We use uh, Mozilla Persona as the authentication source. But the auth framework is designed to let you do that sort of thing. Are, are you using Django for uh, the framework to, I'm sorry, the Django framework for like the admin uh, functionality? Uh, we do have the Django admin enabled and we use it a little bit, but whenever possible, try not to. Okay, I remember now. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there any uh, plans on upgrading the ORM system at all? Because there was a few complaints of the ORM being much slower than say SQL Alchemy. Um, Every couple of years, somebody comes up with a proposal to write an API-compatible wrapper around SQL Alchemy for the Django ORM, and every couple of years, the person who comes up with that idea gives up on it about six months later. Okay. Uh, if somebody can actually do it, I would certainly be interested to see it. Um, but so far, I don't think anybody has really produced a convincing implementation of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi there, thanks very much for the talk. Um, I wonder if, maybe this is a bit obvious or, or you don't want to get into it, but uh, I wonder if I can get you to do the obvious thing and, and maybe compare Django to some of the other frameworks and say where you think some of the strengths and weaknesses in each direction are, just in, in your opinion. And I'm thinking of um, maybe Flask and uh, Web2Py. Um, I like Flask a lot. Um, I haven't had a chance to use it for anything major. I really like a lot of the ideas of paring down to sort of the essentials of doing the web and just saying anything that's not the web, go, go find something else to do it. We're just going to do the web and focus meticulously on that. Um, I really do like that sort of do one thing and do it well. Um, don't really have experience with web to buy, so don't really have anything to say one way or another. Oh, you should check it out. It's magic. Okay. Uh, what do you feel are the worst parts of Django? What needs work? Um, everything I didn't mention is a good part in this talk. Is that, is that okay? No. Um, no, Django, the internals are really messy and really hard to understand. They tend to scare off contributors. We use meta classes way, 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 way too many meta classes in Django. Um, the ORM is a minefield. Um, it's, there are maybe, I think, half a dozen people in the world qualified to actually make serious changes to the ORM code at this point. Um, honestly, I, I think the thing Django needs, a, a, needs the most right now is a good cleaning up of the internals. And granted, some of that's happening. The app loading refactor is one of my favorites that's landing in 1.7. Uh, maybe in the next few releases we can focus on other things. Anybody else? Up. Going once. Going twice. Okay, thank you all for coming out. Hope you have a nice lunch. <laughs>